Hello, AB Bio. This is our video lecture for chapter five, Membrane Transport and Cell Signaling. This is a really good chapter because there's lots of very, very important topics that are first introduced in this chapter that we will revisit again later. So as is our tradition, we begin with the picture. Um, this is a picture of my kids. This is taken a couple years ago. Um, and this picture, Jack, is seriously maybe a month, maybe six weeks old. He's, he's, he's a little tight in this picture. But um, I love this picture because he's sort of given you this like icy stare that either says like, like, what exactly do you think you're doing? Or like, uh, are you sure you wanna do that? Like, do you wanna rethink that before you try and cross the cell membrane? Um, kind of the, you know, the look of, hmm. And the cell membrane kind of does that too. The cell membrane is selectively permeable, which means it dictates what can and cannot come into the cell, largely based upon size. So kind of like the look Jack is giving um, the camera is kind of what the cell membrane does to molecules. It doesn't actually look at them, of course, but it, um, it helps determine what can and cannot cross the cell membrane. So this slide, we've kind of already said this. So we've, you know, the term selective permeability describes the cell membrane. Cell walls are not selectively permeable, but cell membranes are, and all cells have cell membranes. So all cells have this feature. We've discussed from a previous chapter that the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Um, this picture right here, so the, the red spheres with the little gray heads on either side, those are water molecules. The yellow globular looking things are phosphate heads of phospholipids, which are facing water on the top and the bottom. The green are the fatty acid tails, which are nonpolar, so they're pointed away from the water. In this picture, the little blue spiral things um, represent integral proteins, which are going through um, the entire cell membrane. So we've already discussed how phospholipids um, are kind of schizophrenic. The word here is amphipathic, where they have regions that are hydrophobic and regions that are hydrophilic. The phosphate heads, like we just said, are hydrophilic, and the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. And when you put them together, they self-assemble into a bilayer. Um, so the model of the cell membrane that we use is called the fluid mosaic model. And one way to sort of picture this, and this is just kind of an analogy, but um, the cell membrane is kind of like, like if you blow a bubble, right? If you blow a bubble, um, you know, two bubbles can fuse. A bubble could, I suppose, split into two. The bubble itself is not particularly sturdy. It's not really that good for structure. Um, but it does keep what's in in and keeps what's out out to a degree. And the phospholipid bilayer is, is very similar to that um, in that it's fluid. Um, the, where the mosaic comes from, we're going to see in just a minute here. Actually, we'll see it now. So why fluid? So the membrane is not a solid sheet. The hydrophobic interactions that hold the membrane together are not particularly strong. The two uh, halves of the membrane kind of slide past one another. Um, again, not a very strong barrier, but it is a selectively permeable barrier. Um, notice in this picture how some of the fatty acids um, have these little kinks in them, and some do not. And in this picture, we have some cholesterol molecules wedged in. So remember we said from chapter, I can't remember, was it two or three? The saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids. This picture would show ones that are saturated with no double bonds. These are ones that are unsaturated that have one or more double bonds. So fatty acids that are unsaturated um, means that they have double bonds. I'm repeating myself, which means that it's hard to, to pack them in tightly. So if you have a membrane that's getting too fluid, all right, if I, or say, say it's getting too cold, say it's getting too cold outside and the membrane's getting too dense. If I change some of the fatty acids to unsaturated fatty acids, it kind of forces the membrane to kind of push away from each other, makes them less, less dense, and makes the membrane more fluid. So the take home message here is if you want to increase the fluidity of the cell membrane, which like if it's too cold, if you want to increase the fluidity, you increase the number of unsaturated fatty acids, which gives those double bonds, which makes the fatty acids spread out. Molecule cholesterol does something similar. If it gets too cold, you can increase the fluidity of the plasma membrane by increasing the cholesterol content of the cell membrane. And again, at the bottom here, at this point, if the membrane's not um, fluid, it doesn't work right. So if the membrane freezes, nothing can get through the cell, and that's, that's a problem. So membranes must be fluid to work properly. Again, if it gets too cold, the two things you can do is you can up the amount of cholesterol, 
or you can increase the unsaturated fatty acid, um, which gives more kinks to the fatty acid chains. This picture just shows this. This is a very fluid one. This would be not as fluid. And here the cholesterol increases the fluidity. Why mosaic in the term? So if you look at the cell membrane from above, it looks kind of like you have mosaic tiles on the cell membrane. So the mosaic tiles or the mosaic um, feature comes from the fact that there are proteins scattered on the top of the cell membrane or on the inside, and some that go through the entire membrane. Proteins that are integral proteins, integral means they go through the entire cell wall or cell membrane rather. So like this protein right here is an integral protein. Ones that are peripheral are on the surface, like um, these are on, on the inside surface of, of the cell membrane. Ones like that one or that one or that one. Um, glycoproteins, glyco means sugar, proteins refer to proteins. A glycoprotein might be this thing right here where I have the little purple protein, then I have a carbohydrate chain coming off it. Glycoproteins oftentimes serves as attachments on the cell membrane that kind of stick out, pointing towards other cells uh, that have many, many different varied um, features. We'll go through them some in a minute. Actually, we'll go through them right now. So transport, enzyme activity, attachment to the cytoskeleton, cell-to-cell -cell recognition, intercellular joining, signal transduction. These are all things that surface cell surface feature proteins might do. Very quickly, transport, some of these proteins, this is an integral protein, allow a passageway for things to come into the cell, so that's transport. Proteins can also be enzymes. These, this would be an enzyme or more than one enzyme that's embedded in the cell membrane that has enzymatic properties. Here we have one that's attaching itself to the extracellular matrix. Here we have two cells. This is a glycoprotein with a little carbohydrate attachment that's binding itself or attaching to the protein of another cell. Um, here I have two proteins that are just causing these two cells to join together. This last one, signal, um, signal transduction, this is the, the end of the chapter. This is a very, very, very important concept in chapter six, um, or chapter five, rather, we're on chapter five, that uh, we'll see at the end of the chapter. So membrane carbohydrates, we just said how, like in this one right here, how the, the, the surface proteins can help a cell recognize other cells. An example here would be your blood typing groups. Um, the A, B, and O blood typing systems, the A and the B, um, both represent surface glycoproteins that allow the body to recognize cells that should be there versus cells that should not be there, self versus non-self. So the A and the B antigen are just surface proteins or glycoproteins like what's in this picture. Um, if you're type A blood, you have the A antigen. A or B means you have both of them. B means you only have B and O means you don't have any of them. Okay, so membranes also have what's called sightedness. So look at this picture. Do you see I have these Y-shaped um, surface proteins on the outside of the cell? Look where they came from. So the cell first made these proteins inside the ER and inside the Golgi like this. You see what happens where they're on the inside, but when the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, now they're on the outside. So because membranes have sidedness, there's an inside and an outside. And if you want to express something on the surface of the cell membrane, you're probably going to build it and attach it to the inside of an ER or a Golgi body. So when it fuses, it'll be on the outside. So the fact that the cell knows that membranes have an inside and an outside becomes very important when it's fusing things with the cell membrane. Transport through the membrane, remember we said the membrane is selectively permeable. So things that can pass through without any problem, Things that are small and hydrophobic, so oxygen, small hydrocarbons, get through pretty easily. Um, polar molecules that are very small, like water or carbon dioxide, get through pretty easily. Things that cannot get through easily, things that are large, like a molecule of glucose or, or a piece of DNA cannot get through the membrane, which kind of makes sense. And things that are charged, large ions, um, the hydrophobic part of the membrane does not like ions, so they they tend to have a hard time getting through the cell membrane. Transport proteins are proteins embedded in the membrane that allow things to go through. They might just provide a channel. So things that are hydrophilic have a hard time getting through because of the hydrophobic fatty acid tails. But if I provide a channel or a protein that has a hydrophilic channel down the middle, it can just go through that part. Um, 
some proteins actually will bind to a molecule and bring it in. That, of course, requires ATP. That's active transport, which we'll see later in this chapter. This word, aquaporins, so water can get through the cell membrane pretty much no problem. But aquaporins are water channel proteins throughout the cell membrane that allow a special passage for water to get through. Okay, so types of passive transport. Passive transport does not require any energy, all right? So in terms of the cell's currency, it's free. Um, diffusion is just the tendency of molecules to spread out. Things go from a higher to a lower concentration. This term, concentration gradient, so the expression that diffusion causes things to go down their concentration gradient, that's an important concept to have in your head. If I have a bottle of perfume and I open it, the perfume spreads throughout the room, right? That's the perfume molecules going down their concentration gradient. It's passive transport because it's free. Now, if I want to get the perfume back in the bottle, that would be going against the concentration gradient. That is not free. That would require some kind of energy on your part to get the perfume back in the bottle, which would be very, very difficult to do. So diffusion and osmosis, which we'll get to in a minute, are both forms of passive transport. They're when molecules go down their concentration gradient. This picture here, so the top one, I have these little orange circles. Um, I have a, a semi-permeable membrane um, down the middle. The orange molecules or the circles can go through the membrane. So diffusion would say that the, the molecules go to the right. So it's going down the concentration gradient. When there's the same numbers on both sides, it would be at equilibrium. In the bottom picture, I have orange on the left and purple on the right. Orange goes to the right and purple goes to the left down their respective concentration gradients. So osmosis is the diffusion of water through a, a, perme or a selectively permeable membrane. So the definition here where it says water diffuses across the membrane from a region of lower solute concentration to a region of higher solute concentration, that definition is very wordy and it's very hard to, to remember it that way. I use a shorter definition. I just kind of use the trick of thinking that water always follows solute. Water follows solute. Where there is more solute, water goes. So if your solute is some kind of salt, water will go where it's saltier. If it's some kind of sugar, water will go where it's, where there's more sugar, all right? Water follows solute, all right? Where there's more solute, water is going to go, okay? In your head, when you hear osmosis, just think water follows solute, which will tell you where it's gonna go. This definition, I don't think is very useful just because it, it gets kind of messy in your head. This is a classic experiment here, this U-shaped vessel, where I have a selectively permeable membrane down the middle. Um, the little green circles are sugar molecules. The green circles cannot go across the membrane, all right? They're too big, but water can. Um, on the right-hand side, there's more sugar than the left-hand side, and because water follows solute, water's gonna go through the membrane and actually it's going to defy gravity. And after a couple minutes, really, you're gonna have this side of the U-shaped vessel have the higher water level than this side, all right? Osmosis is, is a pretty, pretty powerful force. Um, at the end, it's going to be where both sides of the vessel have the same molarity. Um, because again, you're going to have water going where there's more sugar. That's just the same picture again. So these terms, tonicity is just describing whether a cell is going to gain or lose water. So isotonic, you're comparing two different solutions, right? If they're isotonic, both sides of the solution or both solutions have the same solute concentration. So both sides are five molar, whatever. Hypertonic describes a solution. The root hyper means more or over. It describes a solution where you have more solute. Hypotonic describes a solution where you have less solute. So going back to this picture, um, initially this side's hypertonic. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Initially this side is hypotonic and this side's hypertonic because it has more solute. By the end, they're gonna be isotonic. Water goes, water follows solute, water goes where it's hypertonic, which in this case is gonna be the right-hand side. That's why the water level goes up. Um, the term osmoregulation, so things that live in water, salt water or fresh water, particularly single cell things, you're gonna to have to deal with this. So if you're, a, this is a paramecium, if you're a paramecium living in fresh water, the, your solute, your cytoplasm is gonna be hypertonic to the fresh water, right? So water's gonna to wanna to come in and you could potentially burst. 
These things have structures called contractile vacuoles that pump out excess water. Um, if you're some kind of creature living in salt water, your cytoplasm is going to be hypotonic. The, say the ocean, for example, will be hypertonic. You're going to tend to lose water. So things that live in salt water lose water. Things that live in fresh water tend to gain water. They have adaptations to help deal with this. This is a later chapter. We'll come back to this later. But for right now, just file away the word osmoregulation. It's how organisms control their solute concentrations um, due to osmosis. These terms, turgid, flaccid, and plasmolysis, let me actually show these on the next slide. So um, if I put an animal cell into a hypotonic solution, water's going to come in and the cell is going to burst. If it's an isotonic solution, if five molecules come in, five go out, so it's fine, it's at, it's at equilibrium. In a hypertonic solution, the cell is going to lose water and it's going to shrivel up and die. With plant cells, a plant cell, you know, plant cells can't burst or shrivel because um, of the cell wall. If I put a plant cell into a hypotonic solution, water's gonna come in and the cell is going to swell. The word for that is turgid. This, this bottom sidebar keeps blocking the words, but that word is turgid. If it's an, an, an isotonic solution, water comes in, water goes out, that's gonna be a cell that's limp. The term there is flaccid. And if you put it in a hypertonic solution, it's going to lose lots of water. The word there is plasmalize. And what happens is, you see this like little darker gray area? So this represents the cell membrane, and it's going to kind of pull away and detach from the cell wall. Um, the cell wall is the, the tan color. The cell, the space between them is this kind of like darker tan right here. Um, it's going to plasmalize, and it's going to die. Um, if you understand what's going on in this picture, um, it's just the slide before the words as, as, as a picture. Um, yeah, so make sure you understand this image re really, really well. Okay, so passive transport doesn't require energy. Facilitated diffusion, excuse me, is a type of passive transport where, you know, if you're going down the concentration gradient, this point that I'm highlighting right here, that's going to be passive. With facilitated diffusion, you have a solute going through a protein channel. So it's, it's almost like cheating. It's going through a channel, but it's still going down the gradient. It's still free, so it's still passive transport. So this is passive transport using a transport protein embedded in the cell membrane. If it doesn't require ATP, if it's going down the gradient, it's passive. So if I ask you to give me three examples of passive transport, you could say diffusion, you could say osmosis, and you could say facilitated diffusion. So active transport would be the opposite, it would be moving um, solutes against their concentration gradient. This is going to require ATP, moving, this is putting perfume back in the bottle. This is not going to be free, this is going to be, be a highly energetic process to move things against the gradient. I want to go through a couple examples. The AP exam loves to give you examples to analyze. So the sodium potassium pump, I'm going to take this diagram here and just, um, well, actually, let me go back a second. Um, some people know the nickname for this. Some teachers call it the salty banana. Sodium is salty. Potassium is found in bananas. So the salty banana is kind of a nickname for the sodium potassium pump. And let's go through the steps. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is an a integral protein found in lots of different types of cells. Um, for example, nerve cells have the sodium potassium pump. So look what's going on in this first diagram. I have a, a Membrane protein, the protein can kind of do this number. It can change its conformation, whether there's, there's ATP bound to it or not. And this one holds three sodium sites. Um, this is outside the cell. This is inside the cell. When you add ATP, you phosphorylate the enzyme, and it causes the shape to change. And it causes it to go from like that to that. And it uh, pumps out the three sodiums. Now, that's the left-hand side of the, of the transport pump. Um, on the right-hand side, there's a spot for two potassium. So in this case, <clears throat> potassium comes from outside the cell into the transport protein. When you kick off that inorganic phosphate, it goes back to the original conformation and you pump in potassium. Because this requires ATP, it's active transport. And what you're doing is you're pumping sodium out of the cell and you're pumping potassium inside the cell. So say there's already a ton of I'm going to go back. There's already lots of sodium. Like, look at, look at what this diagram says. It says the sodium concentration is already high outside, and you're pumping more sodium outside. So that's going against the concentration gradient. That's got to be active transport. 
And with potassium, it's the opposite. We're gonna go through an example of this when we do the nervous system. That's like chapter 36 or 37. So we'll, we'll revisit the salty banana later. So just to review, diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and passive transport, um, the salty banana, active transport. Another example that I want you to know, or another, another consequence of this is what's called a membrane potential. So look at this diagram right here. Here I have what's called a proton pump. Protons, so in H+, plus, remember hydrogen is one electron and one proton. There are no neutrons in the normal isotope of hydrogen. If I take away the electron, you're just left with a proton. So H+, plus, a hydronium ion, is the same thing as just a proton. So proton pumps just pump H+, plus, in this case, outside the cell, okay? Now, they're positively charged. So if you do a bunch of that, you're gonna get what's called a membrane potential across the membrane where the inside's negatively charged, at least in comparison, to the outside that's positively charged. Um, nerve cells do this. The way that nerve cells fire, it's an it's a electrochemical signal. It's sort of like electrons going through a wire. It's almost like electricity. Although in this case, it's not they're not electrons. They're, they're ions. In this case, they're protons. So using ATP, you pump protons outside of the cell. This is active transport. This would also mess with the cell's pH. Think about what would happen. What Based upon this picture, what does a proton pump do to a cell's pH? Think, think to yourself before I say it out loud. If you're pumping out protons, it makes the inside of the cell more basic, right? So do this for a couple of seconds. The outside becomes more acidic. And the inside becomes more basic, all right? Um, now, the idea of co-transport, let's take it one step further. So in this diagram, I have a proton pump. It's pumping out H plus, like it, that's what proton pumps do. Now the H plus wants to come back inside the cell. It wants to go down its concentration gradient, but it can't because it can't go through the cell membrane. Well, here we have this thing called a sucrose H plus co-transporter. And what happens is this allows a passageway for H plus to come back into the cell. It's free, it's facilitated diffusion, but when it comes in, it also brings a molecule of sucrose with it. Sucrose is too big to go through the cell membrane, but the way this co-transporter works is the shape is such that when an H plus comes in, so does the sucrose. So is this passive or active transport? Well, it's, it's kind of a trick question because the top part of this diagram is active for sure. The bottom part is facilitated diffusion, so it's, it's passive. So overall it's active, but if a question just asked you about the bottom part of this diagram, it would be passive because it's facilitated diffusion. Um, it's really very smart because a lot, lots of your proton pumps are very, very common. Lots of your cells have proton pumps. There's lots of reasons to pump out protons. To so the cells, kind of like, well, while I'm doing this, I might as well, you know, kill two birds with one stone and bring in some sucrose along with the protons. Sucrose is obviously an, an energy source, so that's something that cells would like to have. Endo and exocytosis is the stuff you did in middle school. Exocytosis is just if you have a transport vesicle, fuse it with the cell membrane, and whatever was in the vesicle gets exported out. Endocytosis would be bringing things inside the cell, the opposite. Um, the three types, phagocytosis is when a cell brings in something that's like a food particle that's solid. Um, pinocytosis would be cellular drinking, bringing in um, something that's a liquid. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is this picture right here. These little Y-shaped receptor proteins actually bind to the solute, and then the cell membrane pinches in. Um, all of these require energy, so all of this is an example of active transport. This is just a diagram of a bacterium engulfing something that it's, no, this is, a, this is an amoeba engulfing a bacteria, my bad. The amoeba is gonna ingest the bacteria for, for lunch. Um, this just shows pinocytosis, and this just shows receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, so the last topic in this chapter is incredibly important. And this is something that we're gonna revisit later. Um, but this is a concept the AP exam loves to ask about. And that's the idea of cell signaling. So this is a long story, but at the, at the core of this, cells talk to each other. Cells have to have ways of communicating with, with one another to make a multi-cell organism even work. If cells can't talk to each other, then there's a problem. And cells have lots of different mechanisms to allow them to communicate. This diagram shows what's called local signaling. It could be something as simple as I have a plant cell here with plasma desmata, and things can go between the plant cells. If things can go between the cytoplasms, then the cell can, in essence, communicate. Um, animal cells have gap junctions, which can do the same thing. 
This slide shows things called local regulators. So in this diagram, these, this cell is giving off these little red molecules that are called growth factors. It could be a hormone. Um, growth factors cause cells to go through mitosis. So if this cell is exporting all these growth factors, the cells around it are gonna divide. What happens to your skin when you get a cut? Well, the cells around the cut divide much faster than the other cells of your skin to heal the cut. So the cells around that cut are giving off some kind of growth factor to cause the other cells to go through mitosis and heal the, the wound. Um, this is showing the neurotransmitter. We're gonna see this when we do the nervous system. This is what your, nerve, what your nerve cells do. This is the end of one nerve cell. This is the beginning of another one. Nerve cells don't actually touch one another. There's a space called the synapse between nerve cells. And the signal goes from one nerve to another through these chemicals called neurotransmitters, things like acetylcholine or dopamine. Um, but it's a way for cells to communicate. We'll come back to that in much more detail later. Long distance signaling, um, an example here would be things like hormones. So there are hormones that are produced in different parts of your body. They get into your blood and go really anywhere your blood goes. So an example might be, you know, your, your brain might produce hormones that affect, um, actually different examples. Say your, your pancreas, your pancreas secretes insulin, which controls your blood sugar. Um, a woman's ovaries secrete estrogen, which might affect things that are happening in, in her brain. So hormones are long distance um, signals because once they get in your blood, they can go throughout your entire body. We'll do a whole chapter on hormones later in the year. This just reviews um, the things that we were just talking about. So the last part of this chapter is really important. And this is the idea of, of cell signaling through a ligand um, or some kind of receptor mediated signal. If you look at what's going on in this diagram, um, you have this molecule that's shaped kind of like a guitar pick, this kind of light red color molecule. It's binding to a receptor that's embedded in the cell membrane. The receptor turns on some kind of uh, transduction pathway through relay molecules. At the end, you have a response, usually in the nucleus of the cell, where something gets turned on or in some cases turned off. Um, this word ligand, ligand or ligand, I've heard it pronounced both ways. So a ligand is a, a signaling molecule that binds to some kind of receptor. Notice in this picture, the ligand does not actually enter the cell. It binds to the receptor, probably changing the shape of the receptor, which then turns on the transduction pathway, okay? This, this guy, Earl Sutherland, um, discovered this. I believe he got the Nobel Prize for this discovery, and this, this is a very important concept in biology. Um, Sometimes it's a case where the, the ligand might bind to a, a, a receptor inside the protein. It might allow ions to come in. They're called ligand-gated ion channels. Um, and the ions don't go through the membrane unless the ligand is there to change the shape of the receptor to allow the ions to come in. So the first step in this three-step process is called reception. And that's when the signaling molecule or the ligand binds to the receptor. There's a couple different ways how, how the receptor works. You have a family of proteins called G proteins. If you look at the diagram, so here I have a G protein um, that can be activated. And what's happened here is, notice on the right hand side, I have an enzyme that's inactive. The way you activate it is the ligand binds to the signaling molecule, or I'm sorry, it binds, let me say that again. The ligand binds to the protein in the cell membrane which activates the G protein, which activates the enzyme, okay? These G proteins are kind of like on-off switches, and what's kind of cool is you could activate one of these that turns 100 enzymes on. So the signal can sort of be amplified, so a very, very, very small amount of, sig of signaling molecule could turn on the, the enzymes of, it, of an entire cell, um, G proteins, okay? And then when you, in this case, it's showing GTP, which is, you know, GTP is like ATP, it's an, an energy carrying molecule. Um, if you inactivate the G protein by losing the GTP, then you turn the enzymes off, okay? Um, a minute ago, I mentioned the ligand gated ion channels. Here I have an ion channel that's closed. Um, the ions are the green things. And the ligand binds to the protein, changes the shape, and the ions come in, okay? Again, the word ligand, the ligand is the signaling molecule that does not actually enter the cell. The ligand binds to a receptor, um, causing its shape to change, and then it does whatever the, the, um, 
proteins are going to do, a G protein opening the channel, whatever it's going to do. Um, this is just the same diagram bigger. Um, now, notice in this picture, here I have, now this doesn't use the word ligand, right? Here I have a signal. In this case, it's showing a hormone. This hormone actually does enter the cell. So testosterone, for example, actually enters cells and goes into the nuclei to turn genes on or off, all right? Some signals do not enter the cell, like in this diagram right here. Some do enter the cell, like in, lots of times sex hormones do this. They can actually go through the cell membrane and go into the cell and bind with, their, with the, the receptor, not in the membrane, but inside the actual cell. In this case, this receptor hormone complex goes into the nucleus and turns a gene on, okay? Um, steroid hormones, nitric oxide, testosterone, those are hormones that can go through the cell membrane. This is just the same diagram bigger. So transduction, so this is the second stage. So the point here is that once you have that signal turned on, it can turn on lots of different ca cascade pathways, all right? So a tiny bit of hormone or a tiny bit of signaling molecule can have a huge effect on the cell. If you look at this diagram, I have the, the ligand, it bound to the receptor, and it turned on this cascade. And basically, you see this word kinase. You have inactive and active kinases. What basically is happening here is once you activate the first kinase, it activates more kinases in sequence to turn on some kind of active protein. All right. This whole thing got started because you activated the receptor protein in the membrane. But then you, you add this term phosphorylation cascade. We're going to come back to that term in a minute. You start this cascade, which, you know, one of these could turn a million, not a million, turn in hundreds, if not more of these to have a huge effect. Um, protein kinases and protein phosphatases. So the verb phosphorylate, this is an important verb. To phosphorylate means to add a phosphate group, usually from ATP. And if you add a phosphate group, usually you turn something on. Protein kinases transfer phosphate groups to something. So protein kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate or turn on the cascade. Protein phosphatases are enzymes that remove phosphate groups or dephosphorylate or are like an off switch. So go ahead and get in your head. Protein kinases, phosphorylate, turn it on. Protein phosphatases, dephosphorylate, turn it off. And both those are, are pathways under the second step called transduction. All right, see in this picture, this is just the same diagram bigger. I, I turn this on and you do this sequential series of phosphorylating until you get to the final active protein, which is gonna do something probably with the nucleus, um, with the DNA of the cell. Um, this term cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP um, is an example. So we, you know, we discussed the whole kinase phosphatase thing. Cyclic AMP is another, what's called second messenger, another molecule that can do this, this cascade, um, like the protein kinases and phosphatases. If you see the term cyclic AMP, just think second messenger, think um, the transduction pathway of a cell. Uh, I'm not gonna worry about that diagram. So the response, this is very short. So usually the whole point of this is to turn a gene on or turn a gene off. So once the signal gets to the nucleus, you're either gonna go into the DNA, and activate a gene or inactivate a gene. Um, and then whatever the gene does will be turned on or, or turned off. Um, so again, just to review the whole thing in one diagram, this is the ligand, binds to a receptor protein in the cell membrane, turns on some kind of, that's reception, turns on some kind of transduction pathway, usually through a phosphorylation cascade, that turns on some kind of protein that goes into the nucleus, this is the response, to turn a gene on, this is showing you turning a gene on, or you could turn a gene off. That's the whole idea of signal transduction. That's a super important concept, um, which allows cells to talk to one another. Um, the chapter ends with just some, some theorizing as to the origin of cell signaling. We don't really need to get into this, but just recognize that all cells can do this. So this is one of these pathways that must have evolved very, very early in the history of life on Earth. If everything can do it, it probably originated very, very soon and then got passed on through evolution to life as we know it today on planet earth okay that was a lot but i hope that was helpful i will see you guys next time